Hello and welcome to another one of our live lessons. Today we are going to be looking at instructions and memory, specifically the fetch, decode, execute cycle. Now I know that we've already been through this once, but this is an, a lesson for us to go back over, do a little bit of revision and to extend our learning a little bit further. So, without further ado, um, don't forget that you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, but that's all. Um, and don't forget to click the little bell so that you get notified every time we have a new lesson. So, let's get ourselves going. Okay, so we are going to be looking specifically here. So fetch, decode, execute will happen uh, whether you are studying in... Um, there we go, there's another one. Um, you'll get fetch, decode, execute whether you are year 10 or whether you are year nine. Um, there are a few little little tweaks that they've made to the syllabus. So I wanted to make sure that we did really clearly um, explain what everybody does need to know for GCSE. Um, however, fetch, decode and execute, incredibly important. So we're gonna be looking at instructions and memory today. So do you remember, and I'm going to get you to pop this into the chat, you can do this into, into the general chat, um, when we save something, so whether it is an instruction or data, what is it that that gets saved into? It is a special tiny, tiny piece of memory inside the CPU and it always holds something quite specific. So I'm going to get you to pop that into the chat for me. Fabulous. Excellent stuff. Captain Magpie's there already. Well done. Okay, so we have, we are fetching an instruction that goes into a register. The data also goes into a register and also the address to go and find that data from. So the idea is that it goes, we fetch it, it then gets decoded, which means that we can then run the instruction, which is executing that's exactly where it's been, yeah. So it, once it's fetched, it can then be decoded. And then once it's executed, we go all the way back up to the beginning and we create a cycle. So sometimes you will see this actually written down as the FDE cycle. Sometimes you'll also see it as the fetch execute cycle. And they miss out that middle bit. So let's have a little look. We're going to start off with an exam question. Okay, so if we have an exam question, let's have a little look here. There we go. I have a simplified diagram of our fetch execute cycle. Can you remember what the one in the middle should be? Bean's got it, well done. Anyone else? Brilliant, Captain Magpie's got it as well. So, Mr Pigeon, would you like to add in yours as well? Can you remember what goes in the middle? So we should have fetch, something, execute, and then start again. So the bit in this middle should be decode. And this is the bit where we actually have to work out what is what is it I need to do. So if you imagine, <clears throat> this is a little bit like when you do your homework. You get your homework, you've got your task, you've fetched it, you've got all the bits and pieces that you need for it, and then you have to work out what on earth you actually have to do. So that working out what you have to do, that's the decode bit. And then actually doing your homework is the executing. Okay, so we are going to look at the von Neumann architecture. Now I'm aware that you've probably also come across this. Now if you are year nine and you are going on to do the new version of the GCSE, it very much depends on which exam board you're studying with. If you are studying AQA, this is something that is still there. 
if you are studying OCR, they've actually removed this section from the new syllabus. Um, so for the 2020, so that's when you, if you're starting your GCSEs in September um, and you are doing OCR, which I know at least one of you is, um, this part is now context because it's not something they test you in. If you are currently year 10, then you absolutely need to know this. Okay, and if you're studying AQA um, or Edexcel um, or um, Educas, again, this needs to, to be in there. So we start off with this idea of a stored program concept. So von Neumann was the person who actually came up with the idea, John von Neumann. And he came up with this idea of a stored program concept. So, think about the way that, that that is actually written out, stored program. What do you think that actually means? Think about the way that your computer is running instructions. Where do those instructions come from? Let's see if you can pop something into the chat to explain what a stored program concept is. Bean, okay, that's absolutely fine. So Bean said, uh, not a clue, not a problem because we're about to explain it. So if you imagine your stored program concept basically means, yeah, so Catherine Malcolm said, it, in here, a program that comes with it, like BIOS, um, it's really, really similar. So if you imagine a stored program concept has all of the data and its programs inside the machine. So Years and years and years ago, when we first had computers, you had to have the data in one file, which had to be loaded, and then the instructions in another, which had to be loaded as well. Um, and they were all saved in different ways. Um, and John von Neumann came up with this idea of, well, what happens if we stored everything inside the computer, um, rather than having to load lots of different sections? Um, and you stored it all as binary. So if you imagine the stored program concept is, it can be reduced down to this idea of everything stored as binary. And in von Neumann, it's all stored in the same place as well. So it's stored in main memory. So that means that we've got our data over here and we've got our instructions over here. Now imagine that the data over here was um, say the number 15 um, and we want to add 10 to it. So we've got two pieces of data. So at this stage, I'm going to simplify it. We're going to store it in just a nibble of data, although that's not technically correct. Um, if I was talking about um, a nibble of data, how many bits would I be using? Let me get you to type that into the chat. If I'm using a nibble of data, how many bits am I using? Captain Magpie's got it. Bean, think a little bit smaller. That's better. Yes, absolutely. Mr. Pigeon, are you going to give us an answer on this one? So don't forget, open up the chat. Just pop that straight in. So if I was to store this as a nibble, I would be wanting to save this as four. So four bits. Let's put that down there. Now remember, a nibble is half a byte. So the number 15, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do my one, two, four, eight, so I've got my powers of two, and then I'm going to work out what the number 15 is 
using four binary bits. So can anyone pop that into the chat? What should the number 15 look like if it was stored directly as a binary number that uses just four bits? Well done, Captain Mapa, you are correct. Excellent stuff. I'm just gonna wait for the others to give that one a go. Well done, Bean, that's brilliant. Mr Pigeon, you gonna give us a give us a go on that one? Okay. So if I add eight and four and two and one, I get fifteen. So if eight plus four plus two plus one is fifteen, how do I get the number ten? So what should our four bit binary number for 10 look like? Well done Bean, that is perfect. And Captain Magpie, super stuff. Absolutely on it today. One, oh, one, oh. So now we have our data. And if we're going to use the correct term for the data in the von Neumann architecture, specifically to do with our, um, our fetch, decode, execute cycle. When we talk about the data that's going into the fetch, decode, execute cycle, we call this the operand. And the operand basically means the data which is being operated upon. Now, over here, I might decide that I'm going to add two instructions and I'm going to have um, a load um, and I'm going to have an add. Now inside uh, my computer I'm going to have this table so this this is a very simplified explanation of what goes on. Um, inside my CPU I will have a table which tells me what particular binary numbers actually mean if they were to be used as instructions. So if I had 1010 and 1111 over here, and this happened to be used in my instruction set, um, this would allow my computer to say, well, if I get the number 1010, that means load something, load a piece of data. And if I get 1111 as an instruction, that means add. So you can see here, there's the potential there for a bit of confusion because 1111 could mean 15 or it could mean add. So let's just make that shush. Okay, when we talk about these inside our fetch decode execute cycle, can anybody remem remember what we called it before? So remember we've got our data, which is the operand and then we also have another O keyword to talk about the instruction itself. So it begins with O. O P, can anyone remember? So we have the operand, which is the data, and we have the, on the other side, we have the op code. So the op code is what should be used. Now, if we took these in sequence, we would end up with, so let's say we had um, instructions go in first, so we load the first one. Um, so it would go 1010111, because the data goes in next, and then one, 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 because it's the instruction, and then we load the data. One, oh, one, oh. So here, this could be read in a whole huge amount of different ways. We could read this as an entire byte of data and just say, well, that's a binary number. Or inside our fetch decode execute cycle, what we could be doing is we're saying, well, actually, the first half is the opcode, the second half 
Here's then the operand. So that's the first stage of decoding. So we're saying well, that section is instruction, that section is data. It gets split up between two registers. And we're going to go into those registers in a second. That means that we can now decode them to say, well, actually, let's go and have a look in our instruction set, which is what this table is here. So if you imagine that's like a little table there. We go look up in the table, so we go and find, well, 1010 means load, and then we've got some data, which is 15. So we're going to start off with load the number 15. OK, and that goes into your accumulator, so we're holding that now. And then the next one, we decode it, so we go over into our instruction set, we find out, so that now means add. So that means, and then add the number 10 to whatever is in the accumulator. So we would then, technically, we haven't got anything else after this, but we'll assume that inside our accumulator we would have added those two together. So the accumulator would now hold the number 25. It's likely that you would have something like an output or a store before you end your program. Okay, so when we talk about the von Neumann architecture, we mean the stored program concept. And the stored program concept means that everything, instructions and data, are both stored as binary inside the machine. And that's why you need to have your decode. OK, we are going to do a little bit of um, annotation. So can you all give me, I'm just going to clear my uh, little thing over here. Can you all give me a great big thumbs up, please, to confirm um, that you have a pen and paper? OK, Captain Magpie has a pen and paper. Quickly, everyone else, go and grab <laughs> Hang on, hang, hang on a minute, just going to get it. Pen and paper. So you're going to need to have a pen and paper on this one. And what I'd like you to do is I want you to take what you can see here um, and write out the five different registers. Now, those five different registers, what we're doing with them is we're going to explain how the fetch decode execute cycle actually happens. Because if you are in year 10 or you're year 9 and you're not doing OCR, then this thing is something that you really want to make sure you've got to grips with. And it's a little bit strange trying to work this one out in your head because it's quite difficult to visualise how this works. However, not impossible. If you have ever played with the Little Man computer, which is a fabulous website, um, although that said it was developed by York University to explain how the CPU works and it allows you to put in low level assembly language programs um, and actually see where everything goes around the different places in the memory. Um, there is a lovely website by Peter Higginson uh, where he created an online version of the Little Man computer and it's broken down a little bit further. Um, so if you do get a chance to do it, and really you, sh you should do it for, for a little bit of, uh, of practice, um, have a play with it because um, understanding where everything goes inside your CPU um, is it's fascinating how it actually breaks things down into really, really simple ways to do things. So think about the way that you do um, you do maths. If you're given a really complex equation, you break things down, you decompose them into smaller, uh, more manageable sections. Well, that's all that this, that's happening inside your CPU. So with your pen and paper, what I would like you to do, just give me a thumbs up, please. So you can do that in the participants window of Zoom um, or just click on the little yes. Um, let me know when you have written down your five registers and we're going to be creating this as a cycle. So the PC is going to follow into our MAR. The MAR leads into the MDR and if you're doing M, uh, AQA that is the MBR not D. So they use a slightly different name. Then the 
MDR leads into the CIR. And then finally, the accumulator. And then we go all the way back to the beginning. Okay, there is one other thing I'm going to draw in here, um, and that is the main memory. So the main memory is going to be over here, and if you imagine your main memory is either your RAM or the cache. So if I am talking about um, main memory, um, we want to be talking about addresses. So which one? I'm going to see if I can test your knowledge from a couple of weeks ago. Pop into the chat for me. Which one is faster? Is it RAM or cache? Well done, Bean. Excellent stuff. Captain Magpie, perfect. Okay, Mr Pigeon, don't forget you can type into the chat as well. I'm looking for your answers. You are absolutely correct. So the cache is much, much faster. It's much smaller and the first level of cache is actually inside the CPU. So when we talk about gathering the instructions, generally it actually comes from the cache, but we talk about main memory as a whole. So in here, if you imagine you've got little addresses, so they're like little pigeonholes for data and they will have numbers. Now, on a technicality, you have absolutely millions of these inside your RAM. So it's very difficult to produce um, a realistic drawing of main memory. Um, so we simplify things uh, to make it easier for you. So the PC will be given the next instruction. So what happens is that the PC actually holds the address of the next instruction. And that comes from a queue. So imagine you've got a little queue. Um, these are our instructions. I'm going to start drawing them as people. So if you imagine you have, there we go, there are our people. There we go, they're not distancing very well. Let's give them some face masks. And they are lining up to go into the PC. Now these people are holding addresses, so they've each got a little envelope, so they know where they need to go. So the PC gets the address of the next instruction. So I'm going to have here holds the address. Now this is important because it doesn't hold the instruction itself; it holds the address. And it's the next instruction. Okay, so here is something for you. What does PC actually stand for? Captain Magpie, well done. Does anybody else remember? What does the PC? actually stand for? Okay, so the PC is the program counter. It's that first stage. It holds the, the address of the next instruction. It's always looking ahead. So because it's always looking ahead, what it then needs to do is it needs to take that next in, yeah, that address of the next instruction and it copies it into the MAR. So there it goes and it goes into the MAR. Now what does the MAR stand for? Now the PC, a bit of a strange name, but the MAR is really, really descriptive. Captain Magpie, well done. Oh, Miss Vision, brilliant, yes. Really close, really, really close. It is the program counter, but you got the counter. Well done, that's awesome. So the MAR.
Well, we know that anything that has an R probably means that it's a register. And if we look at what it's actually holding, it's holding the address somewhere in the main memory. So therefore, the MAR is the memory address register. So brilliant. So the memory address register holds the address of the instruction or the data to be processed. And again, really important that we say the address, not the actual thing. Now we can say also it holds the address of the instruction or its data because later on you also have to go and fetch the data. Now once it's been copied from the PC into the MAR, that means that the PC can then go, oh, and this is what you need to do next. So at this stage, we need to actually kind of do a bit of double back on ourselves here because the PC increments. What that means is that the PC then goes, well, I've given you the address, I can go and get the next one and hold it. So it's always looking ahead a little bit. So this is the stage one, holding the address. Stage two is it's copied into the MAR. Stage three is that the program counter then goes and gets the next one because it's ready to move forward. Stage four is still part of fetch. And what happens down here is because the MAR has got the address in memory, it can then go out and go and get the instruction or the data itself. So here, the MDR holds the actual instruction And the reason it's holding that is because it's brought in from main memory. Now, at this stage, we can talk about buses as well. So the MAR uses a very specific wire. So a bus is just a single wire inside your computer. And actually, you can, um, you can identify them sometimes um, by looking at your motherboard. So if you have any kind of electrical um, circuit board, and you can normally, um, you can actually see, um, if I can do that properly, you can see on your, um, on your motherboard, anything where you have those little gold lines, those are buses. And it allows data um, to flow around the, uh, around the machine. They, there's lots of buses inside your CPU as well. So when you go to main memory, so you need to go and access an address, you would use an address bus. When you bring that data back, you would use a data bus. So this little bit here, the MAR uses the address bus, goes out into the main memory, goes and finds the location, and then it uses the data bus to bring it back and put it into the MDR. Okay, so we're gonna have a little look here. If I am using the term MDR, just get rid of that B for now, and I will put that back in a second. If I am using an MDR, what does it stand for? So we've got a bit of a hint up here in the MAR. And think about what it actually holds. So let's see if you can pop that one into the chat. So the MDR stands for what? Think about what it's holding. So Bean, you're absolutely right. It should be memory something register. It's 
definitely not dragon, but Captain Magpie's right there. It is the memory data register, although I think it should now be the memory dragon register. Much prefer that one. So yes, the memory data register is where we hold either the instruction or the actual data that goes with it. Now, if you are doing a QA, it's slightly different. They call it an MBR. So an MBR actually stands for memory buffer register. Now, can somebody tell me what is a buffer? YouTube. When it stops working you get the little whirly wheel. And when that whirly wheel happens we talk about it buffering. What's it doing if it's buffering? I do like some of these answers going through. So if we're buffering a video, what it's doing is it's downloading enough uh, data for us to actually do something smoothly. It's loading enough data. It's not loading the whole video, but it's loading enough of the video for it to play smoothly. The buffer acts as like a temporary holding place. So the memory buffer register is exactly that. It is a temporary holding place for the data or the instruction until we can actually do something with it. So, that one is number four. We actually go and get the data and the instructions from the main memory. Number five is that something is copied to the CIR. But what is being copied to the CIR from the MDR? Is it the instruction or is it the data? I'm going to get you to pop what you think it is into the chat. Do not worry about getting it wrong, it's absolutely fine. That is what we're here to do, we're here to learn it. So we're copying something, excellent, I've got some answers now. We're copying something from the memory data register into the CIR and we're leaving something behind. Okay, so once we've got everything into the MDR, it is the instruction that's copied into the CIR. And the CIR is another really, really good descriptive register. So we've got an R, which means it has to end in register. What does the C and the I stand for? So for these ones, when we're talking about um, a CIR, we're talking about the current instruction register. So that means that the instruction and the data went into the MDR, so that went into that box, and then the instruction part was taken out and copied into the CIR, leaving just the data behind. So the CIR holds the currently running instruction. The MDR is now just holding the data. Now that means that it can now be executed because we can apply this opcode to this operand. Now remember we were talking about them both being in binary and we needed to work out which bit was instruction and which bit was data. Well by splitting them apart it means you can actually say well this bit is definitely instruction, use that as an instruction because it's still a bit pattern and this bit is data so you can turn it into a binary number. Once you've then applied them together, so we execute the instruction, 
So current instruction register, that was number five. Number six is that you actually run the instruction. And then finally, number seven is to do with the accumulator. So we talked about the accumulator last time being a little bit like the output on your calculator because it can hold a running total. So the accumulator is then holding the outcome of the instruction. Now, if you are asked to describe this in your exam, you might be asked to describe just the fetch part, just the decode part. It's unlikely you'll be asked to describe just the execute. So you might get like a decode and an execute question, or you might get a fetch question. Um, if you did get something which asked you to describe the entire cycle, then that would definitely be a longer answer question. You're looking probably sort of six or seven marks to describe that in detail. Um, that said, I haven't seen an essay question which is that long, um, not for GCSE, which asks you to describe the whole thing. I have absolutely seen the one that looks at the fetch side or just looks at the uh, decode and execute. Um, so for these ones, expect the questions to start off to be quite simple to start off with, so a bit like the one we just saw where it says fill in the blank, and then they ramp up quite quickly. So there will be more simplistic questions out there which ask you to, to describe something or ask you to um, explain some of the registers. And then you might find that they go into a lot more depth very, very quickly. So having something where you have a diagram of each of your registers um, and explaining what they do is a really, really good, uh, good idea. You know, make sure that you have definitely got some notes on those. Um, and if you do want to download some notes, obviously you can go onto the Teach All About It website because there's some downloadable bits and pieces on there um, and you can use those. Okay, let us move on. We are going to do an exam question. So I told you that they ramp up. This one is a bit more complicated than the one before, but it's not as complicated as a long answer question. So let's do a little bit of voting on this one. So I'm going to clear my Zoom vote. There we go. Um, let's see if we can. I'm going to see if I can do this one live. I'm going to do a poll. Um, see if I can put, put a poll in there now. Ooh. Right. Right, I'm going to do which stores the address and which, which register stores the, we're actually doing this live, you can hear me typing, um, the address of the next instruction to be run. Okay, let's have a look. Okay, so we have the MAR, we have the MDR, and you're going to get to vote on this in a second, the PC, um, or the accumulator. Okay, so the next one is which stores are the address where the next item of data This is the same, the MAR, the MDR. Oh, no, come back. MDR, the PC, or the accumulator. 
Okay, let's see if we can launch this poll. Okay, so you've got the first two happening here. I'm going to put this out. So you should now see this if you are part of my Zoom group. This is now on your screen and I'm going to get you to give this one a go. Oh look, there we go. We've got an, we've got one vote already. Come on then, make sure you've all voted. Right, so we have, let's have a look, two votes for the MAR. So let's put that one in there. Do you make sure that you're all voting? So which of the, which register stores the address of the next instruction to be run? Now, this one, remember, is a little bit of a trick question because if we're looking at this one, it's talking about the next instruction to be run which is always going to be the pc so this is one of those things that um, we have a, a a lot of students who do get this wrong wrong and it's absolutely fine to get it wrong um initially and then learn from from this one if it says next it's always going to be the program counter remember the program counter is the ones always looking ahead so and which stores the address from the next item of data will be fetched from that one is the MAR so the next instruction is always the PC um, and then if you're talking about data that would be the MAR okay let's have a look we're going to do the next one as another vote Okay, we're going to launch our polls. We're going to end that poll. Okay, you can share. You can see what happened there. Okay. I'm going to relaunch my polling. Oh, no. Not that one. We want that one. There we go. So, which register that should be stores? There you go. You knew. I know. I was doing it live. Which register stores the result of arithmetic calculations? Ooh. Let's put another one in there. Incremented each time an instruction is run. I can tell you what, if you can do these um, multiple choice questions and you're going to be typing these PCs out constantly, um, you're going to get used to them. So we have two votes in. Don't forget, if you are on our Zoom group, you should be voting. OK, so we have one vote for the MDR and one vote for the accumulator. The result of the arithmetic calculations, and it's the word result that's giving us the hint here, goes into the accumulator. So, excellent stuff, well done. So yeah, so the MDR is gonna be getting the data, the actual data. The result goes into your accumulator. Fabulous stuff, well done. Okay, let's try this again. So, which register is incremented each time an instruction is run. So this one should be in your notes.
Ooh, look at this. We seem to have a unanimous PC and you are absolutely correct. Well done. Right, last one. Fabulous. So let's make sure that that's in there. It is incremented, it is the PC that's incremented. That was in the notes. Fabulous stuff. Last poll is here. Okay, which register stores an item of data that has just been fetched? Hey, there we go. Definitely peeking towards the end. So, it is the MDR, it's the memory data register. Absolutely, yep. Memory data register is the one we're looking for. Super, okay. So, although there were a couple of little misconceptions there, that's okay at this stage because remember, while we're actually doing these polls, while we're guessing things, we're trying to work through our notes, the fact that if you get something wrong and you learn from it, it's absolutely brilliant. There's nothing wrong whilst you are learning, no, not just computer science, but anything at all. There's nothing wrong with getting these wrong as long as you identify what you did get wrong and also why as well. So if you, um, especially for that, that first one, if you had stores the address of the instruction to be run, you would have been absolutely correct it was the MAR because it says next try and underline the things that you're looking for there and what we'll do is each lesson we'll keep putting these these multiple choice questions in we'll do some polling and things like that um, just so that you can identify things that uh, that you want to make sure are in your notes so if there's anything in there that you got wrong try and highlight it on your notes as well because that will really really help you to then go back and know what it is that you need to revisit so one of the things that I would say to a lot of students is that when you are revising, try and revise the things that you get wrong rather than the things you're really happy about. And I know that we prefer to go back and look at the things that um, are easy or the things that we feel really comfortable with. Um, but if you start with the really tough stuff, you're actually going to make more progress. Um, and don't feel that you need to get everything right instantly uh, because there are a huge amount of key terms that you need for computer science so work on it try and make little we call them marginal gains if you're if you're an adult um, but small gains keep moving forward as long as you are moving forward in a little in a, in the positive direction that's what we're looking for okay we have a little bit of time left Let's see if we can start off. We'll do an introduction to our CPU components, but we're not going to do the whole thing. Right, so this little diagram here, if you've used my website, you'll have seen before. Um, and this one here shows you how everything interacts and there are reasons for the arrows and everything else. The CPU is often described as what? Can you pop that into the chat for me? How do we sometimes describe our CPU? I'm going to give you a hint with some terrible, terrible drawing. Yes, absolutely, well done. It is the brain of the computer. Basically, it's where all the thinking happens. All of the instructions happen, it does all the logic, it does all the maths, it works out what, it, what the rest of the computer needs to do, so the rest of the computer acts a little bit like your body. Inside that brain, there are also, just like ours, different sections that do different things. You've got the registers that we've just looked at. You've also got a thing called the control unit, and you've also got the ALU, which is the arithmetic logic unit. Now remember, most of these have been named um, using American terms, so arithmetic would be what we would classify as maths. So let's have a little look at the control unit. The control unit acts like the manager of the whole CPU 
And what it does is it actually controls how the fetch decode execute actually happens. It controls all of the other components. So it tells the registers when to fetch, when to move them across, when the PC should increment, when you should pass something to the ALU. And it does that using control signals. So if we um, act like a manager, and sends control signals. Can anybody tell me how it sends a control signal to another component inside the CPU? uses, now we talked about these very briefly before, uses these little wires that go through the CPU, single wires. Okay, and it uses a thing called the control bus. So if you see the word bus, the word bus literally means a single wire which allows data and signals to go through. In this case, the control bus, we call it unidirectional. I'm going to pop this up here. So when we come back next time, we can have a little quiz. Unidirectional means it goes one way. Now I'm going to explain this in a, a, a parent term. So as a parent, I will tell the children to tidy their room. This is not a two-way conversation. They don't get to negotiate this whatsoever. It is telling them to do something. And this is what the control unit does. It tells the other components what to do. It doesn't allow for any communication backwards. If you have a bi-directional bus, that means the communication can go both ways. So the data bus is bi-directional because you can load data and you can store data. So a bi-directional bus two ways. If you imagine binary has two digits, which is why why the bi. Two. Uni means one. So unidirectional, it goes in one way, bidirectional, two ways. So the control bus is a unidirectional bus because it is sending a control signal. Okay, so we have nearly hit our half past. So I'm going to leave it there. At the beginning of next lesson, I'm going to create a little quiz for you. Um, and we're going to add some more of those polls as we go. So you can test out your knowledge as you go. I love that, Bean. That's an amazing way to remember it, that you can remember uni because of a unibrow. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so... Thank you for you for those of you who have arrived for our Zoom group. Uh, remember, I'm going to send out the links so that you can watch this back as well because we are taking the um, the recording, which means that you will be able to go back and revisit the lesson. Um, and I will see you again on Friday, uh, ten past ten, for programming. Okay, take care, guys. <laughs>